So this is going to be my very quick video review um, on my Forbidden Dreadnought. I've owned this bike for a year now and I think I'm qualified enough to give a bit of an opinion and a bit of a review um, of my experiences with this bike. So I bought the XT build which I think at the time represented quite good value for money. Uh, I think it was 6,400 or 6,300. Unfortunately as with everything the price has gone up now so I think you're looking at about 6,800 for the same build. Um, but yeah XT drivetrain, XT brakes, uh, DT Swiss 350 hubs on E13 rims and obviously Maxxis tyres and E13 bar and stem as well and then you've got the Fox 38 Performance Elite and the Fox X2 Performance as well so all in all I think it was a good spec and it's one of the reasons why I purchased the bike in the first place so the other reasons I purchased this bike one for the Fox 38 which I was keen to try also the fact that it had 29, 29er wheels front and rear um, and also the fact that I could mullet the bike using the Ziggy Link uh, made this bike quite appealing, quite versatile potentially. Definitely a trail bike would be the ultimate bike for me. I do mainly trail riding uh, with obviously ambitions to ride more technical and challenging terrain. But the reality is that this bike is a little bit too much bike and I think it's made worse by the fact that it does have that rear axle path for the swing arm. So obviously the bike grows in length as the axle uh, rear wheel goes through its kind of uh, swing curve. It travels back which means the bike lengthens out uh, and the bike obviously becomes more stable but it does mean that the bike is less playful. So it's harder to pop off of things, um, I guess harder to pop off jumps and definitely harder to bunny hop and manual if that's what you're into. But obviously if you want the most stable fastest bike downhill it's going to come at a bit of a compromise um, and that's what this bike kind of was marketed for as an enduro race bike uh, or bike park bike so we can do it all it comes at a bit of a price obviously it's you know a big bike like this it weighs 16 kilos exactly which is not too bad for the weight given that's with pedals and everything as I would ride it including my water bottle mount. There are of course a few changes I've made, uh, carbon bars, different grips because I wore out the old ones and obviously the discs and the brakes have been changed. I ditched the XT ones in the end uh, despite getting on with them really well I just fancied upgrading to the Hope Tech 4 E4s and so far they've been really good. I did change out the seat for a different seat but that's purely down to personal preference. I've had no issues with this bike whatsoever apart from a little bit of cable rattle which I managed to fix using some wiring insulation. So yeah it's a bike that is designed for charging downhill as fast as possible and obviously this last year we've witnessed it in the Enduro World Series and also been used on the Forbidden downhill team before they got their downhill bike. So it's obviously a very capable bike despite um, having only 154 mil of travel on the rear. Uh, forbidden to say that it rides like a longer travel bike even though it's only got that much travel. Um, I wouldn't say the suspension personally feels quite as plush as say a 170 mil travel bike at the rear but obviously the way that it charges through terrain and eats up the bumps uh, I guess it is comparable. So. Yeah, it's definitely the most confidence-inspiring bike I've ever ridden. And you know, faced with the the most challenging terrain or trail, uh, this is definitely one of the bikes that I would pick. And as I say, the most confidence-inspiring and probably capable bike I've ever ridden. I know a few people are going to be wondering about the idler pulley, and probably have a few questions regarding that. So hopefully, I'll be answering a couple of those questions. Um, one is drag. Now obviously it has to add drag to the drivetrain. I don't think anyone can really argue that but it probably is a very marginal amount and probably not enough drag to actually make a difference. But one thing that I have noticed is the noise that it makes um, which is not the bearing inside but rather the outer parts 
which obviously make contact with the um, pulley itself as it spins round and it just makes a kind of rotational noise shall we say and I although it doesn't probably add much drag when you're slogging your way up a climb it does kind of put you off and make you think is that sapping some of the you know power away is there some drivetrain loss uh, and I think it's just because it's audible and yeah it's just it's a little bit irritating occasionally but for the most part you don't really notice it the only other thing with it is the cleaning aspect I find that the only way to do it properly is to remove it give it a clean on the back side which you can't really access and then of course re-grease it and re-bolt it torque it back up uh, so it's a little bit extra maintenance but for the intended purpose of the bike being aimed at being a race bike or enduro bike uh, I don't think it's end of the world stuff so of course you know is the rear wheel axle path and the high pivot design necessary personally I don't think so for my own riding ability and the type of riding that the majority of us do I don't think it is worth it I know a lot of brands are going that way uh, they all want to follow suit providing and making the fastest and best enduro bikes but obviously you know for most of us we're just riding local trails and we're not racing at the very top tier so uh, yeah personally I don't think it's necessary but it's interesting it's definitely more bike than I need but it's done everything that I've asked it to I've been on cross-country rides trail rides I've ridden bike parks and uplifts have pretty much everything uh, and I've not really had any issues with it the only thing that I like I said earlier was the lack of playfulness from it being able to bunny hop and manual stuff with ease is kind of something that I would look for um, in the next bike I'm not sure that that's something that Forbidden will be able to do with their next bike or next Dreadnought the Dreadnought 2 I don't know if that will go hand in hand with it being an all out race bike. But yeah, hopefully this mini review has been of use to someone potentially looking into buying one of these bikes. Um, my best advice I can give you is to go and demo one. See if you can find somebody who's got one, try it out, or just like I say, get to a demo day because it does ride a lot different to what I expected. Um, it's quite a big bike as well, size large. I'll put the geometry specs up on the screen now but size large I think it's 485 reach so it's quite a large reach it's a very long wheelbase and of course it does grow by approximately 30 mil uh, during the travel um, or rear travel anyway so it's a big bike and it gets bigger as it goes through the suspension travel so yeah bear that in mind I mean potentially I could have sized down and gone for a medium and probably found that was a good balance between uh, being playful and you know being a stable bike but anyway size large is what I went for I'm five foot eleven and a little bit so just a smidge under six foot um, and I think I have kind of a balanced leg to arm ratio I would say I'm pretty average in that in that respect um, but it's not too big a bike it's just a big bike but yeah thanks for watching this review and see you in the next video